Um, I'm going to open the session. Um, uh, my co-chair um, here and I are going to uh, uh, preside over the session on neuromonitoring this morning. Um, I have the great uh, pleasure of introducing our first speaker. We're going to try to move it ahead relatively quickly because I think we're already behind. It's um, my friend uh, Frank Russolo from Italy. He's going to talk. It's going to give us sort of an overview. He's going to talk about essential multimodal non-invasive neuromonitoring. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Jan, for the introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. My first slide, please. OK, thank you. So uh, these are my conflicts of interest. Uh, it is the 31st of August, and this first slide is dedicated to those who thought they would be on vacation today, like myself. And uh, so we, I would like to uh, start uh, this, um, uh, this lecture with uh, a few questions regarding uh, multimodality monitoring in general. First of all, as intensivist, what is my main goal? My main goal is that to uh, avoid or at least to treat uh, what we know is the uh, uh, secondary brain injury. And we know we can't do anything about the uh, primary brain injury, but we also know that um, in order to uh, pass from primary to secondary brain injury, I like to look at it as a, a mace where going from point A to B, if we want to block the mouse from going to the cheese, we can't just block one path if there are many paths. We need to block all the paths in order for our therapy to be successful. And we know that even the two major causes of a secondary brain damage are influenced by many other uh, factors. So what tools do I have at hand in order to uh, avoid this? We know that from the best trip trial, and you've seen this thousands of times, maybe one tool is not enough. Plus, uh, just by looking at having one number at hand, we can't decide, we, we don't know what has actually caused that single number to variate. And besides, it's not just the di uh, diagnosis of that single parameter, but it's also mainly what we actually do to treat that parameter once we have, um, we have it. And we know that, for example, cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, we, can, uh, we, can, we can have uh, brain ischemia and altered lactate pyruvate ratios even in the presence of normal cerebral perfusion pressure. And this is just an example of a pay, one of our uh, patients who had had a craniectomy who has a normal ICP, 15, the uh, CPP was 65. However, the patient was under the cerebral autoregulatory range. And the, as you can see here, the PTI, the uh, brain tissue oxygenation parameter, was quite low. So with one single parameter, we wouldn't have captured this. Even regarding flow metabolism coupling, this is a very nice uh, uh, clip in an animal model showing uh, very nicely flow, uh, the relation between flow metabolism the green area or the neural, is the neural tissue which uh, becomes green once the uh, neural activity, metabolic activity increases and it's, and it's uh, simultaneously followed by vasodilation of the vessel bringing nutrients and oxygen in particular to the, uh, uh, to the brain tissue requiring the uh, supply of oxygen. And we know that uh, we can have ischemia even in the presence of normal cerebral blood flow if the metabolism is higher and we're not able to uh, satisfy the oxygen requirements in that area of the tissue. But we can even have brain ischemia when there's normal flow metabolism coupling if the mitochondria is not working or are not working properly. So we know that from the uh, consensus regarding multimodality monitoring that uh, we may benefit from uh, a multimodality monitoring system. Why? Because this would help us connect uh, what they call the brain dots. The more information we are able to derive, the better we're able to have a 360 degree uh, visualization of what's going on within the brain to reach a therapeutic strategy. Now, this is uh, one of our patients. The slide is quite, this is quite, it's quite mm, old. It's an eight-year-old slide. But we have the works on this patient. We have a lot of multimodality invasive monitoring systems. And we also have a lot of non-invasive monitoring systems on the same patient. So the question is, are, is the 
uh, neural non-invasive multimodality monitoring system capable of uh, substituting the invasive monitoring systems. I won't be speaking about brain imaging or biomarkers. We would need another talk for that. So the big question, of course, is do these multimodality monitoring do these monitoring systems in general actually work? Okay, so I'll sum it up. The following are the neuromonitors which have concretely been shown to improve outcome in brain injured patients. I thank you very much for your attention. We could all go have our 10th coffee of the day if I were to stop here because there is no concrete evidence to show that a single monitor, multimodality monitoring system does improve outcome. So this leaves us with even more questions when we need to apply a multimodality monitoring system, let alone a uh, non-invasive one. I've picked these three uh, mm, particular areas that we need to have information from in order to apply a multimodality, non-invasive, essential monitoring system. First of all, regarding the, if we do have a brain problem or not, we could obviously apply a neuro exam, which is very important, but it's not specific enough, especially during the uh, uh, initial phase or in a patient who is not awake. And we could, this can be, uh, we can help, uh, we can be helped by the presence of, for example, automated pupillometry. I could take the mask off, which could give us information regarding activity of the uh, brain stem. And uh, we've seen from a few published papers, which is just an example, that by adding uh, evaluation of the, of the pupil, in this case with automated pupillometry to the four score, we're able to uh, have a more precise uh, visualization of what is going on neurologically and with the, through the clinical exam. In this paper, they've shown that especially in low uh, mm, numbers of the uh, GCS, Glasgow Coma Scale score, there wasn't a optimal correlation between what we saw with the four score and the GCS. So GCS alone may not be enough. And regarding pupillometry, it's very easy. It has a fantastic, we all know, a very fantastic learning curve. And what has been missed by um, many uh, nurses in, uh, in the papers which are out there in literature can be actually captured by using simple automated pupillometry. And evaluating pupils is not just important in the narrow intensive care environment, but it's also very important even in the general ICU. For example, besides papers published by colleagues like Tarek Shashar. This is a uh, relatively recent paper showing that in uh, general ICU environment, non-neural patients, and there are 128 abnormal uh, pupillometry exams uh, for, uh, recorded in 109 patients of various types. So it's important to evaluate patient neurologically, but also if you're going to evaluate the patient neurologically, you have to do it with a more precise technology. And it's useless to go through all the recent, very, these are very recent papers just um, correlating the use of pupillometry with delirium uh, or um, through uh, using pupillometry in order to evaluate the success of a of, uh, uh, therapy following um, non-convulsive status epilepticus. But what I find interesting is the, are the, uh, is the literature regarding the uh, use of pupillometry in post-cardiac arrest. And this is a, a very nice, uh, nicely well done paper which shows that by using automated pupillometry up until day two, for between day one and day three, if you have an NPI index below two, uh, this would be correlated with a 100% positive predictive value and also a 100% um, specificity. Therefore, if there is a problem seen on the pupillometry exam, most likely the patient will have a uh, bad outcome. If you associate this with uh, mm, uh, somatosensory evoked potentials, then you may have an increase. You can have, obtain an increase also in the sensitivity. Uh, they, some authors actually took it a step further where they used uh, pupillometry during, during cardiac resuscitation and they, also, and they correlated this with the return of uh, spontaneous um, uh, rhythm. Uh, in this case, they used the pupillary light reflex, and they've seen that patients who had a conserved, preserved light reflex during resuscitation actually had a better outcome. This is repeated in a very recent model, uh, animal model, where they also measured super perfusion pressure, entitled CO2, which would give information also regarding splanchnic perfusion in general, 
and uh, uh, non-invasive uh, brain tissue oxygenation and cerebral blood flow. Again, they also found a correlation. And this is also a very recent paper where they take it even a, a step further also here where they used continuous pupillometry. Yes, that is a underwater uh, mask uh, where they apply the pupillometry continuously and they seen that when during uh, cardio uh, pulmonary resuscitation, if you had either an increase or a decrease in the pupillary size, you would have a better outcome than uh, if you would have no variation in the pupil diameter during cardio pulmonary resuscitation. We're performing, we're about to start a multi center uh, trial in, uh, in northern Italy. It's about to be, uh, um, we're about to have published the, uh, the uh, trial on clinical trial .gov. Uh, we have, uh, we're looking at, uh, as a sample size of 250 patients, and we will be looking at the pupillary light reflex and its uh, correlation to return of spontaneous, uh, uh, to spontaneous circulation in, in these patients. 250 patients may seem a lot, but believe me, we've calculated that we'll probably reach the target within just a few months there. We obviously know how many cardiac arrests there are. Who will do the uh, pupillary light reflex? We're going to train the uh, personnel who, uh, either the voluntary personnel or even the drivers. So uh, the other question was, is the brain getting enough fuel? Um, I think that when we're speaking about uh, fuel, we have to know how much uh, oxygen is uh, arriving into the brain. And I think we get a lot of information from brain ultrasound, which will give us information regarding in indirect information regarding ICP, cerebral blood flow velocity, obviously, cerebral vascular autoregulation, and also with uh, a brain ultrasound, we could actually see what's going on within the brain. We could see if there are any, uh, if there's any masses or if there is a presence of displacement. Um, but uh, uh, again, here also, there's not enough time to go through the very recent literature, but I would suggest for you to look at this uh, paper, which kind of sums it up. It will give you uh, a general idea of the use of uh, brain ultrasound, both within the neurocritical care environment and outside the neurocritical care environment, which I find it very interesting when uh, we speak about the use of brain ultrasound, even in the early phase of treatment of um, the patients who are not only brain injured, but even multi -trauma, uh, multiple trauma patients or, or uh, other types of uh, pathologies. We obviously know that uh, we've used, uh, brain ultrasound is used quite often to measure intracranial pressure non-invasively, uh, but also it's being used even more and more often to measure um, cerebral autoregulation. Now here, this is PRX, so we're not using transcranial Doppler, but it's a recent paper published, it's a conjugate, showing that measuring, it's feasible to measure the, the optimal CPP in patients, and that is the uh, cerebral perfusion pressure um, um, at which the patient would be more protected based on the cerebrovascular autoregulatory state. And it's ac actually, and we know that patients with brain injury are very oftenly uh, having um, altered cerebral autoregulatory uh, status. And it's possible to measure cerebral autoregulation non invasively with uh, transcranial Doppler by using one of the indexes, in this case, the MX. Uh, brain tissue oxygenation, I won't speak about this uh, too much because I know there are other, there's another talk following mine, but there are uh, many uh, monitors out there and um, I have to say that if we were to answer these three questions uh, asked uh, by the colleagues in this paper uh, in order to, to evaluate if a monitor is valuable or not, I find it difficult to actually have a positive answer for many of the monitors that we use. Uh, and in particular, uh, the uh, NEARS. But I have to say, there uh, is a lot of literature being published, the recent literature, showing a fairly, uh, re um, relatively f positive results in various areas, in, in particular during subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, and maybe the use of other ty various types of uh, NEARS uh, technology, not only a continuous uh, wave, also optical uh, neuromonitoring during cardiopulmonary resuscitation also in this case. But I think that until now, most of the uh, reviews uh, haven't shown any positive results, any benefits from uh, NEURS monitoring. There is one review uh, 
in this case, it, which is ongoing, I believe it's still ongoing, which hopefully will uh, uh, shed some light on the use of, uh, of NIRS. Uh, so regarding NIRS itself, I'm pretty sure, I'm confident to say that one day NIRS, NIRS will completely substitute invasive brain oxygenation monitoring, but I'm not sure we're quite there yet uh, today. And this may be the case for, many, as I mentioned previously, many, many monitoring systems. The, is the brain using a, uh, its fuel correctly? Well, I think we could derive this information non-invasively from brain functional monitoring. I'm not going to look into uh, evoked potentials, but uh, until now, uh, in, within the ICU, um, EEG has been mostly used for detection of, of uh, uh, seizures and non-convulsive seizures, and we know that by using it continuously, major, maybe we will be it's, 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 uh, we'll be able to derive better information, a lot more information than using it uh, um, non-continuously, especially, and this is a paper showing that using it, by using it continuously, they were able to capture more uh, ictal events, but this was not correlated to outcome. Uh, this, uh, in this systematic review, they've used EEG in order to reduce the incidence of post-operative delirium. This is in, within the anesthetic uh, environment, and we know this is a very recent paper just published showing that uh, by uh, maintaining the patient with a light sedation and anesthesia, there was a better outcome at one year than uh, a heavy sedation. Within the intensive care environment, uh, the, we know that um, uh, this, is, this is a paper published in, in uh, critical care medicine uh, in intensive care patients, we know that the problem uh, regarding awareness is not over. Um, we've been speaking recently about over sedation, but we haven't resolved the problem of uh, under sedation. Uh, we've seen from this paper, Critical Care Medicine, that in fact the problem still exists. There's a lot of uh, um, under sedation in patients who are mechanically ventilated and uh, with muscle, muscle paralysis. So uh, in ICU, monitoring deep sedation, we know that from the early phase of when the patient arrives in, in uh, uh, just tell me, just give me a hint when I'm finishing my time. Two minutes ago. <laughs> you started late, right? You could. So, sorry? You started a couple of no, minutes wait, late. No, just tell me when, uh, two, when it's up, I'll just kick minutes. me off the stage. Uh, <laughs> in the early phase, uh, over sedation is quite common, and this has also been linked to outcome. And we know that, in general, over-sedation is linked to a negative outcome, in particular delirium. These are two recent papers showing that in COVID-19 patients, the problem of delirium is very, very, very present. So it may be worthwhile monitoring the depth of sedation in these patients. And we're performing a study looking at that at the moment. I will finish with multimodality monitoring the concept. It's obviously important to monitor patients with a multimodality monitoring system. This is a very nice uh, paper looking at, uh, in pediatric uh, population, they didn't look at a clinical outcome, but they looked at, at how many times multimodality monitoring actually influenced uh, decision making. And so in conclusion, with all the monitoring systems, invasive and non-invasive systems that I've spoken about, if you were to choose either the red pill, which would be a totally invasive multimodality monitor system, or the uh, blue pill, a not totally non-invasive multimodality system, I think a, somewhere in between with a multimodality monitoring systems with the systems that I've shown you, plus possibly in the ICU, brain tissue oxygenation in particular cases, and when needed, I think for metabolism, uh, microdialysis. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Unless there's really burning question due to delay, we should maybe uh, go further for the next presentation. It's going to be uh, Professor Matthias Heringlake. He's going to talk uh, about oxygenation monitoring by near infrared spectroscopy. Please. Chairman, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the kind thank introduction. You. I'd like to um, draw your attention from the neurocritical field to the cardiovascular OR.
because this is clearly the place where suboxygenation monitoring by the infrared spectroscopy has uh, probably plays the most important role nowadays. And the reason why we are interested in this technology are simple. We are facing patients that suffer from neurological damage, either as a stroke or even more frequently from so subtle um, derangements like post-operative cognitive dysfunction or even more frequent delirium. And we know that these entities are associated with a poor prognosis. Um, has been shown for cognitive dysfunction, depending on the um, various definitions, but it's also been shown for delirium. And the interesting question is, can we use cerebral oxygenation monitoring to reduce the burden of these neurological complications? But it's not that simple, as already brought up in the first talk. And I'd like to uh, start with some technical aspects, and then I will present uh, some information how we can use this uh, technology, but also discuss with you some unsolved questions. Well, most of you are familiar with this technology. Um, we can use it because the scale can be penetrated by light and photons follow a banana-shaped path within tissues, totally different to the situation here. Otherwise, the photons would spread out uh, completely irregularly. But um, if you enter some light by diode, uh, light emitting diode, and you use two sensors a little bit apart from each other, you can use this uh, technology to get an information about the oxygenation state in the more superficial or the more deeper parts of the brain. And by subtracting one information from the other, you get an information about the tissue oxygenation that, uh, in the vessels here in this specific area. Well. What we measure is, of course, depending on the distribution of blood. We don't measure within tissue. We measure within vessels. We measure blood oxygenation. And um, usually, we go um, from the uh, perspective that roughly 75 to 80 percent of the blood is venous, 25 to 30 percent is arterial or capillary blood. And um, the different commercially available oximeters on the market use different AV calibration ratios, some 25 to 75 or 30 to 70. And of course, they use different wavelengths. This is something that may be important. Another point is, this is a static situation. And we don't know, really don't know, what happens during exercise, during the uh, situation when we use vasopressors or something else that may change the distribution of the venous to arterial blood in the brain that um, this is only one part of the story. The next part is that the devices are calibrated based on the assumption of the distribution of arterial to venous blood in, in volunteer studies. This is accomplished typically by down-breathing um, volunteers, usually healthy students, to lower oxygen levels, and thereby to um, calculate and um, the difference of the arterial and the uvular bulb saturation according to this AV ratio, and thereby calibrating the, the system. So we get an estimate by using this technology. We don't get a real number. You shouldn't compare p tissue uh, PO2 with the numbers you get here, because it's really an estimate. Nonetheless, an estimate that works, as shown, for example, in this animal model, where you can see that a reduction in um, cerebral oxygen saturation measured by near-infrared spectroscopy correlates clearly with reductions in cerebral blood flow. And the lower the levels, the higher um, is, uh, the lower is the brain ATP concentration. Of course, the tissue is ischemic. But we also have to think that we measure something on the brain that is, of course, influenced by the systemic circulation. Um, roughly 20% of the blood in the brain, uh, of the cardiac output goes to the brain. And of course, you cannot ignore what happens in the rest of the body if you measure something on the, on the forebrain. And so you get an information on one hand on cerebral blood flow, cerebral oxygenation, but also on the systemic level, something you have to keep in mind when you want to interpret this data. Of course, something also helpful if you are going to use this technology in the OR and you want to optimize the cerebral oxygen saturation readings. You can use an algorithm like this one presented by 
um, Andrew De Noe and John Morkin several years ago. And you have to optimize thermal perfusion pressure, the um, carbon dioxide concentration, and of course, oxygen delivery and consumption, because these are the factors that may influence the cerebral oxygen saturation reading, and of course, the oxygenation in the brain, at least in the small area you're measuring. But please keep in mind, this algorithm has been developed for one specific oximeter that colleagues used at that time. We don't have any comparable data whether other oximeters behave comparably. And this is, of course, important because there's a spreading number of uh, these devices currently on the market. Hopefully you can hear me already. Um, I'd like to be a little bit louder. <laughs> well, and this is a really important information. If you compare different cerebral oximeters, has been done uh, by Phil Beckler, he is one of the um, guys who are calibrating these devices for the industry. And they, he showed that um, there's an extreme variability in the numbers, and you cannot translate one information you get with one device to the information from the other one. And this may have clinical implications. For example, if you look for the relationship between cerebral and mixed venous oxygen saturation. We did this in a small series of patients and um, extubated on the ICU. And what you can see, there is a clear significant difference in the correlation between mixed and cerebral oxygen saturation readings with different devices. And this has implications because one device is capable to show that the mixed venous saturation is beyond 50 or 60%, that means in a critical range, the other one is not capable to do this, suggesting that it's maybe more um, focusing onto the brain and less onto the systemic perfusion. But if you take, think for this algorithm, of course, the way you optimize the levels may be completely different. There are other potential confounders you have to take into account if you use this technology. Uh, one is, of course, the signal goes through the um, superficial tissue of the forehead. Of course, if you have a scalp that is so fat, you get another number of, if you have someone, an old lady, 50, uh, 45 or 50 kilos uh, weight. And um, if you have a lot of uh, extracranial tissue between your light emitting, sensor, uh, light emitting diode and the sensors, of course, cutaneous vasoconstriction may also have an impact on your reading, something that has been brought up by some colleagues in the past. And consequently, it's clearly important to keep in mind that you cannot um, transfer the information from one device that has been published for one device to another on the market, something brought up by the POCWI in a recent recommendation. Well, what can we do with this technology? We can use it, for example, at least one specific device for risk stratification. We use this in a series of cardiac surgical patients. The lower the preoperative saturation, the poorer was the outcome. This has been repeated by some colleagues in New York. Slightly different numbers, but nonetheless, those entering the cardiac OR with a low cerebral oxygen saturation reading are at risk for a poor outcome. Not only mortality, but also, for example, delirium. This is a, a series of roughly 200 um, 230 patients, and what we could show in this, um, this series that patients that developed a delirium postoperatively had a lower preoperative oxygen saturation reading, either with room air or after oxygen application. Um, this has been confirmed in various settings. Extremely recent publication, one or two months ago, published in uh, ANA, identical information. The lower the preoperative saturation, the higher is the risk to develop delirium. But all these studies were measured with one device, with the inverse. If we now go for another system, the foresight, a Swedish group, they came to the completely different conclusion. They didn't see any difference in the preoperative saturation in the patients that developed delirium. They observed significant difference in the postoperative part, and they stated that in contrast to our assumption that the preoperative set may be a risk factor for developing the delirium, that the delirium leads to a post-operative reduction in cerebral oxygen saturation. So a completely different 
conclusion based on the use of different technology. I think this is really interesting and has a lot, um, it's something we have to keep in mind this because uh, this may explain the heterogeneity in the meter analytic data. Because if we go for some systematic reviews or um, expert statements, you will find there is at present no conclusive evidence that this technology does really improve outcomes, at least on a high evidence-based level. A little bit some years older, but um, they came at least to the conclu uh, conclusion that this technology in the cardiac OR is extremely helpful to detect a cannular malposition, especially in children, of course. But um, they didn't see any association between a decrease in cerebral saturation, poor neurological outcomes, and a goal-directed approach to um, improve these numbers. A difficult meter analysis published by some British colleagues, um, they went to an analysis of published data. They were primarily, uh, most of these studies aimed for a ne neurological um, focus, had looked for POCD or delirium or something else, but they entered hard outcomes like mortality. And what you can see here, there were only a <laughs> few people that died in these studies, and actually they didn't see an effect of the cerebral oxygen saturation monitoring. Um, this, I show this uh, meta-analysis because it's perfectly published and frequently cited, but from my perspective, this does add nothing because the numbers presented in this um, meta-analysis are so low, you had, uh, there should be more than 10,000 patients included in the meta-analysis, then it would make sense, but not these 800 his colleagues used. The most recent Cochrane analysis is a little bit more uh, distinct, more or less neutral. They say, okay, the con evidence at that time is not that convincing, but the may change if a few further studies are published. And one clearly positive study published in the Canadian Journal comes to the conclusion that the use of this technology and the goal-directed approach to prevent cerebral desaturation is indeed helpful to reduce PUCD and um, cognitive decline and to reduce the stay on ERCU. Together with Thomas Sharon, who will also talk a little bit later here, we did a, um, also a um, systematic analysis of this topic and we also entered some data from outside the cardiac field and I can't go into the details for the sake of time, but um, at the end, we found most studies pointed into the direction that a decrease in cerebral oxygen saturation is a bad sign, and that improving this, uh, the oxygenation will indeed benefit to the patient. And if you bring this all together, you end up with a slightly positive signal that the technology may be useful. Well, but there's something else you can use the technology for and has been all this has also been shown in the last talk. You can use it for monitoring auto regulation by uh, substituting the double signal um, by an oximetry signal and by uh, correlating the pressure and the cerebral oxygen saturation reading. And if you look for the uh, lower limit of auto regulation and the change in the correlation between cerebral perfusion pressure and cerebral blood flow, you can see if there is a strong correlation between both variables, you're probably on the increasing part of this slope. And if you're on the flat portion, um, uh, um, portion then you will find no correlation. And by this, you can calculate a cerebral oximetry index to individually determine the lower limit of autoregulation of a specific patient. And this will be extremely helpful. Unfortunately, it is uh, still pre-commercial, but the groups that work, that work on this have, um, there's a recent review on this uh, topic, shown that it's extremely helpful. If you perfuse the patient higher than his lower level of autoregulation, you can avoid major morbidity and mortality in the cardiac surgical population, reduce the risk of acute kidney injury, and um, can also avoid hyperperfusion if you increase the pressure too much. But as said, there are some things, some things that are also unsolved because this is a 
pilot study to look if it's feasible to use the, uh, uh, the algorithm developed by Andrew Denot in a larger multi-center trial. And the colleagues were rather successful in avoiding cerebral desaturation, but nonetheless, they didn't see any differences in outcomes. And they calculated that the numbers we need oh, no, and to use is extremely high, 3,000 to 4,000 patients for stroke and other problems. And furthermore, it may be important to know the baseline of these patients, because the patient that starts with a low set shows a totally different pattern to someone who starts with a normal set in the specific situation. So we have to think about larger and highly allergen studies we have to develop to further uh, set the evidence for this technology. And I'd like to conclude with a um, slide of the um, mm, for, uh, post-operative quality initiative, what we know about peri uh, perioperative cerebral oximetry. We know the baseline is important at least if measured with certain oximeters. We know that it may be used intraoperatively to avoid the catastrophe, the uh, misplaced aortic cannula, and also at least the trend towards a reduction in ICU stay. And um, we don't have that much information about the postoperative part, but we also may use this for monitoring autoregulation. Nonetheless, all colleagues I know that use this technology they won't skip it. They will use it further despite the evidence is that slow. And probably they have read this, a Cochrane analysis on the user's pulse oximetry that clearly shows there is no evidence that pulse oximetry improves outcomes and no one from us would enter an OR and uh, care, take care of a patient without using a pulse oximeter at the end. And thereby, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, really great presentations. Uh, we're running a bit behind, um, really, for once. It's not the fault of the speakers, because we started a bit late. Um, can, if there's a burning question, maybe we have time for one question while I think, Giuseppe, you're speaking next while you get ready. And any burning questions? Did I scare everybody <laughs> with that introduction? OK, Giuseppe. Good morning. Could I have my slide? I think. Uh, the aim of this talk is to discuss about uh, ICP monitoring, and uh, I think I would like to clarify something from the starting. We already heard uh, in the previous presentation that monitor could not change uh, the outcome of the patient, and we are sure about that because uh, you have a warning system. It depends uh, what is your reaction to the warning system, and it depends if you can control the event uh, that is giving you a signal a warning. So talking about ICP, we build up uh, the agenda of the talk is to discuss uh, what we know about ICP and then I will present uh, the data coming from uh, a study we published recently, the synapsis study, and then I go to the conclusion. Thinking about uh, the uh, ICP monitoring uh, started in the 60s, so we are still using it because we believe that it's useful and I will try to demonstrate you with observational data the utility of the system. And I think uh, Lundberg at that time m measured the events, but uh, there, are not, uh, there wasn't a link, a close link with therapy. And I think this is the important point I want to send to you. Because when we take the information from larger series and all the evidence we have on which a patient to monitor or not to monitor comes from this study, 1982, observational study, 200 patients, first generation CT, and on the first generation CT, you cannot see that diffuse axonal injury as small hematoma. And uh, if you have a positive CT scan, we have a high probability to have an IICP. But we move forward in the fourth edition of the Brain Trauma Foundation, we wanted to have uh, real evidence. As the first speaker says, we don't have a class uh, uh, a, a evidence uh, on this topic, level one and level two. So we say, the American guideline says that we know that ICP could help treating the patient, but we don't know in which patient to insert the catheter. So I think it's a, it's a strange situation. If you go in another setting, think about SIH, subarachnoid hemorrhage. The American guideline says that uh, the ICP monitor should be, is not mandatory, but should be undertaken in more severe patients 
and the ventricular catheter is suggested. Also, in uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, the same, even if we don't apply so frequently monitoring in uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage patient, patient in coma with uh, herniation or hydrocephalo have an indication for an ICP. We, uh, with American Society of Neurocritical Care and the American and European Society of Intensive Care, we say that probably, even if we don't have any evidence, having a protocol-driven therapy in patient at risk could benefit. So we put together two elements, the therapy and the monitor, not only the monitoring by itself. But at the end of the day, we don't know which patient will benefit of a monitor. And the other point is the link with the therapy, because we have a warning signal and we react to a warning signal with the a therapeutic effort. And the, the only randomized control trial has been published by Randy Chestnut, because in the setting of South America, they were not using the ICP routinely, so it was ethical at that point to do it in that countries. It's not ethical in my country, in Europe and the USA, to do it because is a standard of care to monitor ICP today. What is so, in a small number of patients, 150 each group uh, roughly, he, he, he had a group in which he tried to control ICP below 20 and a, a group in which he looked at clinical sign. He built up uh, a therapeutic uh, flow chart, and as you can see, the patient that didn't have any ICP had more therapy, more aggressive therapy compared to the patient without ICP. The monitor was a power for a strange outcome because a composite outcome, I would like to focus on death. 5% difference of death in the two groups, but the trial was unpowered for demonstrating a change in mortality, but the signal is there. So what we did? We did run a very large observational study called Synapse ICP that has been founded by the European Society of Intensive Care. has been published a couple of months ago on uh, uh, Lancet Neurology. And so we, we tried to have a large amount of center, 146, 42 countries, and we selected patient, comatose patient with intracranial cerebral, intracranial hemorrhage, spontaneous intracranial hemorrhage, traumatic brain injury, and SIH. And we wanted to describe the practice, but we wanted also to understand if we were able to have information on the benefit of monitoring and treating ICP. So these are the flow chart of the patient. We have 1,063 that didn't have an ICP monitoring and 1,300 that had an ICP monitor. It's an observational, pure observational study. We didn't ask to the center to do anything. And we asked it to the center to participate only by Twitter, by email, and so we were able to have 146 center without any support. And uh, looking at the population, is a typical population. We are talking about a patient uh, roughly 55 years old. We have older patients with intracerebral hemorrhage, and uh, the characteristic of the population is the typical population you see in your unit with this three pathology. We wanted to have an overall picture of the world, but due to the constraint, we didn't have so much found. We have only found for having a research assistant for doing this job. We have mainly data from America and Europe, and the 2,300 patients are mainly from Europe, but also from America. Asia, we were able also to have some patients from Africa that usually doesn't come to clinical trials, something from, from Oceania. For example, we have 10 centers in Nepal and we didn't know what is going on in Nepal uh, today. And uh, we have uh, half of the population were TBI, the other half was alpha and alpha intracerebral hemorrhage and SIH, and as I said, 56% had an, an ICP monitoring. We ask the reason for monitoring to the center, and we would like to focus you about the reason for non-monitoring, because some center didn't have a monitor available, Coagulopathy is a contraindication. Some patients were not uh, able to be saved, so they didn't uh, feel to insert a catheter. And some, some patients were not severe with a radiology imaging, and some patients didn't have a local policy for inserting an ICP. The type of ICP used 
is mainly a parenchymal device, mainly in traumatic brain injury, and is done in the operating theater or in the ICU. But uh, there is a lot of discussion if intensivists could insert a catheter, 97% of the catheter has been inserted by a surgeon, and I think uh, it needs to be done by a surgeon, is my opinion, is my personal opinion. And as you can see, uh, we see that most of the patients receive antibiotic prophylaxis, and it's very common to change the catheter during the monitoring system, and these are the reasons why we change. And the mean duration is eight days, and is last and longer with SIH patient. I think we were able to capture variability, and is what is happening in your center. And the probability for the same patient to have an ICP is 100%, is 0%, as you can see, and I can explore the Europe, for example, in my country, for example, center very close have different policy for inserting the device. So the same patient could not have uh, the same treatment. And uh, this is uh, summarizing this uh, uh, caterpillar process says that we have a probability four times for having or not having an ICP for the same patient. But we link it also therapy. The patient have a different uh, therapeutic effort having ICP. ICP uh, require more treatment compared than not ICP, and this is distributed here in the two classes during the day. And if you will go to the end, we saw, and I would like to reveal something to you, that the patient with an ICP had a lower mortality at six months. And that could be said, you selected the patient because we selected the patient we wanted to save. But we did a, a lot of analysis on it, and we tried to understand with uh, advanced analysis, because we look at the association between ICP and something like pupil reactivity, and we were able to demonstrate so strongly an association with severity of a patient seen as pupil, loss of pupillary reactivity and the benefit of having ICP, because as you can see, the mortality is quite reduced in this setting. Then we remove the patient that were going to die in the first two days. So the more severe patient that were, were going to die with or without an ICP device. And we saw the same effect. So also avoiding removing the patient more severe that could not benefit of having an ICP because they are going to die in two days, we have the same effect. And the same effect comes in all the pathologies and is much stronger in SIH. A, a setting in which sometimes we discuss about inserting or inserting a ventriculostomy, for example. And going to the conclusion, I think you have always to think when you're talking about monitoring, about the link between the warning signal the monitoring is giving to you, the therapy you are doing to the patient, and the result at the end of the story of the patient. But this link between the two, not only measuring will change the outcome. The other point is that uh, uh, Synapse ICU uh, highlights something we need to think about. We don't have clear guidelines for inserting a catheter. We have a much more therapy. We try to treat the patient with a monitoring, helped by monitoring system. It is different from the, uh, the trial by Randy Chestnut. And uh, the association, because it's an observational study, we can also only say there is an association, is very strong, an association with ICP monitoring, therapy, and outcome in the more severe patients. So I probably we need to think about, and I think the signal is there, and I think uh, we were able from an observational study to understand that we are going in the right direction, measuring and treating ICP in the more severe patient. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. We have gained a few minutes, and if there's any questions from the audience, otherwise uh, uh, we are aware our speakers as well to participate in other sessions, so we have to keep going. And if there will be some time by the end, maybe we will collect questions then. So thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Bouza from uh, Grenoble in France. Uh, who will drive us to uh, the mysteries of PBTO2 uh, uh, measurements. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, the invitation in the Congress. It's my pleasure to be here. 
and I'm going to present you the interpretation and uh, the usefulness of uh, PBTO2 monitoring. I mean, I will mainly focus my talk on TBI because PBTO2 is very useful in TBI. I, I won't go into SIH and cardiac arrest patient, but we're going to talk about this uh, later on. So, okay, so why do we want to measure brain uh, oxygenation in our patient? Obviously, because it's one of the major determinants of secondary brain injury. And so by measuring PBTO2, you can have numbers and maybe you can treat those numbers to normalize brain oxygenation or to improve brain oxygenation. That's the main reason why we want to use PBTO2 in our patient. The point is we have to understand how to interpret, sorry, I, <laughs> I tip my mask, it's better. So we have to interpret how uh, the PBTO2 uh, is linked to. So we have two hypotheses for brain hypoxia. The first one is a macrovascular dysfunction. We know for years that there is a decrease in CBF after traumatic brain injury, and so you can have a drop in oxygen delivery. You can also have a drop in arterial oxygen content, meaning that you have a drop in oxygen, in hemoglobin concentration, or in PAAO2. So this is the macrovascular dysfunction linked to uh, brain hypoxia. The second hypothesis is a microvascular dysfunction. As you can see in this microscopy electronic view of uh, brain capillaries after traumatic brain injuries, this capillary is completely surrounded by brain edema. So you can easily understand that the diffusion from the capillary to the tissue could be impaired after traumatic brain injury and may cause brain tissue hypoxia. This concept of microvascular dysfunction has been highlighted since uh, 15 years, and the first demonstration was made by the team of Cambridge. They really do a small study. They compare two types of region in an angel brain. They look at low PPO2 region, hypoxic region in uh, black dots, and the normal PPO2 region in white. As you can see at basal level, there is no significant difference in terms of CBF, CBV, um, CMR2, oxygen extraction. But when you perform a stress, for instance, an hyperventilation test, you can see the decrease of CBF in the two zones, but in the hypoxic region, the oxygen extraction fraction could not increase, meaning that there is no capability of the brain to extract more oxygen, whereas in the normoxic region, the oxygen extraction fraction can increase. So this is the proof that macrovascular dysfunction exists, and they also illustrate the microvascular dysfunction by using microscopic electro, uh, electronic microscopy. And most importantly, brain hypoxia may occur despite normal CBF. Because sometimes brain capillary are completely collapsed. This is another experimental study. We made an experimental study using a rat model of TBI. And here are the astrocytic end foods that completely swollen and compress and collapse the brain capillaries. So you cannot deliver oxygen to the brain, even if the CBF is normal. And when you have a huge heterogeneity within a region with some capillaries that are collapsed, capillaries that are normal, the result is brain hypoxia. And also when you have an heterogeneity in red blood cell transient time into the capillary, the result could be at the end a brain hypoxia. So you, can, you have many reasons to have brain hypoxia despite normal CBF. This is really important to understand. That may explain silent hypoxia in our patient. The first criticism of PBTO2 is that very local measurement. You only look at uh, 7 to 15 millimeter square. It is very, very uh, small region. And we look at very heterogeneous region. Around the probe, you have arterial, you have veins, you have tissue. So you have a lot of things that is mixed together. And obviously, this could be seen as a very, uh, a, a very um, important limitation because you are only watching a small part of the brain. But I think the success of the PPTO2 is the failure of the other monitoring. If you look at NIRS, I'm not talking about the palliative setting, but the NIRS in the neuro ICU, you have uh, extracranial contamination uh, by the uh, blood in the skull. You also have uh, uh, venous bulb jugular saturation that is really too global. So 
you have also other limitation to this monitoring and PBU2 seems to be, I think, the better tool than NIRS of and uh, satural bulb, satural bulb jugular saturation. Right, what are the normal values? So the normal value has been uh, established in patient undergoing neurosurgery. Here is the delay for a stable measure. It's around two hours. I know the companies say longer, but in two hours you have stable measurement. In the preoperative settings, it was the normal value higher than 20 millimeter of mercury, and in post op value, it's, it's around uh, higher than 20 millimeter of mercury. And we consider <laughs> we consider normal value between 20 and 30 millimeter of mercury. For the abnormal values, there are no clear consensus, but most protocol begin to treat patient under 20 millimeter of mercury, and they consider a critical threshold when the PBA2 goes below 15 millimeter of mercury. The ring was shorter, no? <laughs> so the overcriticism regarding PB2 2 is that when you increase PAO2, when you increase FIO2, you increase PBTO2. So one could say, what is the point of looking at monitor who only mirrors the PAO2? But the reality is more complex. Here you have two different models that, theori that theori the theoretically uh, link PBTO2 to arterial oxygen content or PAO2. If you consider that PBTO2 is, is a black line, is directly linked to arterial oxygen content. So when you go to hyperoxic values, higher than 15, you expect few changes because of the hemoglobin dissociation curves. If you expect a, a model that is completely linear between PaO2 and PbTO2, so you have here the dashed line. The, the reality of PbO2 measurement is in between. When you measure PbTO2, you always are in the gray zone. It means that it is more complex than a simple relationship with arterial con oxygen content and a more complex relationship between PaO2 and PbTO2. You have to take into account CBF. You have to take into account oxygen diffusion. So it is very more complex than the simple linear relationship between PbTO2 and PaO2. Obviously, PaO2 have an influence on PBTO2. This was clearly demonstrated by several studies. This was a retrospective study made in the University of Pennsylvania when Mauro Odo was uh, working there. You can see that according to different PIO2, FIO2 range, you can see the PBTO2 value, and there is a drop in PBTO2 when the PIO2, FIO2 ratio goes down. It's exactly the same for hemoglobin concentration. You can see that below nine gram per deciliter, you have a drop in PPTO2, so arterial oxygen content is obviously an important factor also to interpret PPTO2. But obviously, diffusion is also an important parameter, and you have to keep in mind that the only way to make the diffusion from capillaries to the brain tissue is only a decrease in brain tension and uh, oxygen tension from the capillary to the cell that drive the oxygen from capillary to the cell. So finally, what is the best relationship uh, to explain uh, uh, PBTO2 values? I think Rosenthal and colleagues may create the good equation and they found you using different challenge, MAPS challenge, hyperventilation challenge, um, oxygen reactivity challenge. They show that PBTO2 is proportional to the produce of cerebral blood flow by the art arterial venous tension oxygen, which is the difference between PI2 minus PV2, PVTO2. So when you have low PBTO2 at the base site, what does it mean? It could be a technical problem. Okay, this, the probe does not, does not work. It could be linked to a low CBF. The regional CBF is low, so you have a low PBTO2. It could be linked to low arterial oxygen content, low hemoglobin concentration, low PaO2. And it also could be linked to low diffusion process, meaning that you have a brain edema and the oxygen cannot go through 
the capillaries to the brain tissue. This is, I think, the four main explanation uh, for uh, low PPTO2 at the bedside. Where to put the probe? I think the probe ideally should be in the tissue at risk, but in clinical practice, nobody knows what is the tissue at risk. So I would suggest to put the catheter in normal parenchyma, because in normal parenchyma, you have a good correlation between regional CBF and global CBF. So when you manipulate the CBF regionally, you expect global changes. And how to assess its functionality, you may, can make an apparexia test in PBO2 to increase when you put the IFI2 at 100%, between 100 and 300%. What about the pronostic value? PBO2 is an independent pronostic factor beyond ICP. What is really important is that it is dose dependent. It's not only the, the, the value, but also the, the time. The time frame, you have the, the low PBTO2 value. It's really important. And most importantly, some patient may have silent hypoxia, meaning that some patient had normal high CP value, but you can see hypoxia on the brain PBTO2 monitoring. And for the diagnostic point of view, PBTO2 had an information about CBF. You can see that CBF is really determinant of PBTO2 values. So we look at different uh, uh, parameters of multimodal monitoring to uh, detect low CBF at the bedside, and you can see that when you had PBTO2 to the high CP, you have a better accuracy to diagnose low CBF at the bedside. What is really important as well to understand is that regional CBF is really an important uh, determiner, is really important to, uh, to, to link uh, low PBTO2 to regional CBF, as you can see here, there is, when you have a low PBTO2, PBTO2 value, you have a low uh, CBF. And most importantly, the oxygen reactivity is also impaired when you have a low uh, CBF at the bedside, meaning that you cannot improve uh, so much the PBTO2 when you increase the FIO2. And is, here you have huge standard deviation, here the standard deviation are very low. And some page, some uh, also try to link CPP and PBTO2. They call that the oxygen reactivity index. It's only a way to adapt the CPP to, uh, to have the better PBTO2 for a given CPP. So you, it may be uh, a way to uh, individualize CPP at the bedside. So what about, sorry, what about the uh, impact of PBA2 gadget strategies uh, in our patient? The only RCT so far is the boost to trial, and this is a positive trial that found that using ICP plus PBTO2, we reduce the burden of uh, brain hypo hypoxia, and you also improve GOS extended in the patient, and the, the favorable outcome was higher in patients treated with ICP plus PBTO2. But if you look into details, there is a big bias in this study. And if you look at the numbers of patients with basal system compressed, you can see that in the patient with ICP only, there was uh, statistically, statistically uh, mo uh, most patients with basal uh, system compressed. And this is real bias because it may in explain completely the result, I think. So the boost free trial, the, the story continues, the boost, the boost free trial is ongoing, and we hope we have the, the results soon. In my center in France, we coordinate the OxyTC trial, which is uh, the same trial. Uh, it is quite the same criteria of inclusion than the BOOST2 trial. And we also look at the impact of PBTO2 and an algorithm to manage PBTO2 on the non regical outcome. We just finished the study, so don't, I don't have results uh, to present you. The inclusion uh, had stopped on, in June tw uh, 21. But the follow-up is not over, so I don't have uh, any uh, result to present you, but I think next year we have the result of the study. We managed to include 300 uh, patients in the study. So for take a message, I hope that you are convinced that episode of brain hypoxia are deleterious. It may be independent of ICP, it's really important. To depict them, you have to monitor PBTO2. It's the only way to detect brain hypoxia right now is to monitor it with using PBTO2. The interpretation is quite tricky. Uh, you have to integrate CBF, hemoglobin, PIO2 diffusion, 
And there is a signal in the literature that PBO2 guided strategy may be beneficial, but we have to wait for our clinical trial. I thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, so we caught up a little bit with time. We, two of our speakers are still here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and any questions from the audience? We got like five, to seven minutes. Well, I might have one then. Yeah, uh, we correct the values for the temperature. That's like the catheter sensitivity. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I was wondering, like other factors like pH that might influence the affinity between uh, hemoglobin yeah. and oxygen, should we think about a sort of correction when they are extremely low or extremely high? <laughs> Hopefully not often, but. Uh, we, we do not correct uh, PBO2 value for pH, but you should be aware that pH modification may induce change in affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. So when you are performing therapies that induce alkalosis, for instance, you may have an increase in PBO2, but it's rather an increase in affinity of oxygen to the, to the rather than a, an increase of oxygen delivery. So you should be aware of that. <laughs> Acidosis induce a rather a, uh, an increase in delivery of oxygen, but you should be aware of pH modification to interpret and to interpret, interpret the action of what you are doing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a question for Matthias as well. Um, so you spoke about Nearsen, it was very interesting data that you presented. Um, obviously, the operating room is a bit different to the intensive care unit, and, uh, but can you talk a little bit you have such a large data set, so it's, it's a great setting. Did you sort of systematically look at confounders that you could identify that could influence and give, could give you a, a wrong signal? Yeah, I think the, the, the problem is, um, from my perspective, the influence of, uh, of the systemic uh, circulation on the cerebral oxygen saturation signal, because we cannot clearly rule out at least if the device, the cerebral oximeter, is influenced by the systemic perfusion, if the go-directed approach we perform based on the readings on the, on the forehead um, is identical to that what we do as a go-directed hemodynamic optimization. Mm. So um, there is at least the, 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 the slide I showed regarding the different reactivity of patients presenting with a low set and a normal set towards uh, perioperative uh, decrease in cerebral oxygen saturation reading points in a way that those patients presenting with a relatively um, difficult circulatory situation, those with a poor cardiopulmonary performance, are those that uh, on one hand do not benefit that much from this go-directed approach because the <laughs> basic um, uh, signal or the heart failure problem may be too strong to, um, so that we cannot overcome it by our um, 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 uh, treatment approaches in contrast to the one who is, enters the OR in a relatively healthy shape and he may be s a subject to mismanagement in this way. But we cannot really distinguish between the um, oxygenation of the body and the brain. And this is clearly one important confounder and actually I always thought about a study to solve this problem. It's rather tricky to do this in the OR, of course. Yeah. Very interesting. And um, yeah, one question for you as well, if I may, or any, oh, no, you, you go ahead. Two go questions ahead. from yeah, the yeah. audience too. I'm sorry, do, do we have a microphone, a microphone maybe? Yeah. Thank you very much. So maybe the microphone can already go there. So the to question the next is question. regarding uh, normal baric apraxia, increased PBO2 values at arterial level, but nearest values remain at venous level. How to explain that? Okay. I think 
it is not increased to arterial uh, levels. It just increases the PaO2. The PbTO2. When you increase PaFiO2, uh, you increase PaO2, and then you increase PbTO2. But you never reach the level of PaO2 because there is always a diffusion, and you have always uh, the oxygen tension that is different from capillaries to the tissue, because it's only this tension that drive the uh, oxygen. And the nearest value remain at venous level. I, I'm not sure it increases as, as well. But you, you, your, your question is, you, you see, it seems that PB2 increased much than, than NIOS. I never put NIOS and PB2 at the same time, so I don't know. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe. In some instances, uh, uh, you may, may see less reactivity on the um, thermal symmetry readings if a patient has a preoperative, for example, a preoperative kidney disease or uh, something uh, that may um, change the, the measurement by chromophores. Uh, for example, this is a typical situation if you have someone who's uh, for a long time on an extracorporeal life support system. Um, he has um, some m many other chromophores now also in the tissue, and the readings go down over time, and you will come to a point where there is no mm, really strong reactivity because many other confounding chromophores um, disturb the, the measurements. This may be, for example, an ex explanation if you have someone for a long time on your ICU and has it was a uh, polytrauma and he uh, got multiple infusions, got kidney injury and something else, then it may be, explain, um, it may, may be reasonable to assume that P, uh, PBO2 probe reacts while the cerebral oxygen saturation does not, or not that much. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I think that the, when you put the NIOS, you are exploring uh, the, the biggest part that is explored is the venous compartment because it's around two-thirds yeah. of, uh, of the region you are looking at. That's why... NIOS looks like SVG would do if you want, like the saturous venous bulb oxygenation. It's more related to this value. I think this is because you, the venous compartment is very large in the region that you explore. One uh, question. Uh, short question to the PTIO2. You told us that you're measuring in an area of 7 to 15 millimeters square. Yeah. To how many cubic millimeters would that correspond? How many? Cubic millimeters. Measuring in a three-dimensional. Yeah, aesthetic. it's one cent one centimeter cube. Okay, thank you. Right, it's very very low, very low. Quick quick question, and then we have to yeah. move on with the next presentation. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Bozak, uh, have you got any experience with uh, a, a different probe, uh, different from Lycos, the Neurotrend uh, probe? Have you have uh, have you any experience with that? So I only use uh, the Clark probe, so it makes the Integra uh, probe. I, n I never use an optic probe. Experimentally, we use an optic probe, so I, I don't have the experience of an optic probe, only the Clark technique probe. So I don't think there is too much difference. It's only the way you measure the oxygen. But uh, I will trust the Clark probe because we've been using for 20 years, I think, so we only use uh, the Lycox, uh, Lycox device. Great discussion. Thank you very much um, for staying on. Really appreciate it. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Professor Janneke Horn from Amsterdam. She's going to talk on current use of neurobiomarkers. Thanks a lot. Hi. Thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation. It's great to be back in Brussels. I'm from Amsterdam. That's quite close. As you can see, and this is what Amsterdam looks like, as you have uh, had a funny piece of cake or something. Um, <coughs> these are my disclosures, and I have a disclosure. I'm a shareholder in a very nice restaurant in Amsterdam. So if you ever visit the city, go over there and have a nice dinner. So I'm, I was asked to tell you about neurobiomarkers, and this is the ID. If you have brain damage, Proteins and substances are released into the blood, and you can send a blood sample to your lab and get a result, a figure, and it tells you what's going on in the brain. That's nice. So what do we know about this, and what are the advantages and, and maybe the disadvantages of this technique? This is what you have to think of when you... What do you want to know? How much brain injury is there? Uh, does it help you to tell anything about the prognosis? 
what's the effect of the treatment you're currently giving to your patient. Um, and having in mind all the people that we sedated for a long time during their COVID-19 infection, it might be nice to know what's going on in the brain during long-term sedation. So they might be helpful there. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so which diseases can you use them in? Um, I think acute brain injury, which is the group of, of uh, stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, patients with TBI. Uh, these are the kind of diseases where you could think of using neurobiomarkers in the ICU. A lot of studies are currently being done in, in more chronic diseases, such as uh, MS or Alzheimer's disease, but that's not really what we're interested in on the ICU. Uh, cardiac arrest patients is a group where we use them, and as I already mentioned, the long-term sedated uh, patients. So if you, if you think, yes, this sounds good, this is what I'm going to use, there's some things you need to keep in mind. Um, which biomarker would be best in which disease? And are they reliable? Do you get the answer that you want or do you need? Is it easy to get the results? Some of the biomarkers, which you can find in literature, your lab will not want to test them because it's very difficult techniques that need to be used. And you want a test result quick. If you send a sample to your lab and you get the result three days later, it's not very helpful. So another thing to keep in mind is what's the half-life of the, the protein you're looking at? If you want to change your therapy or your treatment strategy in your patient based on the results of your neurobiomarkers, you don't want to use a biomarker with a half-life of several weeks, and they exist. And that's, of course, also which is the best moment of assessment. When's the peak in the blood, or is it going up or down? What are the cutoff values you should use? Uh, what are other sources in the body which can release this protein and um, what happens if your ICU patient develops kidney failure? And uh, does it raise then in the blood or what's happening? And what's going on if you put him on renal replacement therapy? So these are just a kind of thoughts which you should have when you, when you start using a biomarker. And this is not only for neurobiomarkers, it's for any biomarker. So um, let's go to the neurobiomarker. This is a picture of the things we have in our brain, the parts and the different neurobiomarkers which, they, which you can find in the blood. For example, here you have from the dendrites, you get the neuron-specific innerlands, the exons give you neurofilament light, and uh, here's the astrocytes which give you two other many studied uh, biomarkers. And they all end up in the blood where you can measure them. You can also do this in cerebrospinal fluid, but that's of course not as easy available as blood. So let's focus on that. So I, I thought I, I'll go through two brain diseases that we often see and see what, uh, what's available in the literature on that. So check the Brain Trauma Gui Foundation guidelines and biomarkers are not mentioned. That's interesting because quite a lot of research has been done in this uh, in traumatic brain injury. And um, I was just wondering, does anyone of you use these biomarkers in severe traumatic brain injury patients on the ICU? Please raise a hand. Yes. I hope you come into the discussion and tell us what you do with it, because uh, you're the only one. Um, you can use it if you, if you go through the papers published for uh, the severity, and this is mainly done on the ER. Um, so it can tell you whether you need to do a CT scan in this particular patient. And it might be able to predict outcome. Now that's a nice thing to have in the ICU. Maybe mortality or the neurological outcome. Will this patient recover or will he, be, he or she be severely handicapped in the end? So a nice review was published in 2019 and they collected all the studies which were done in um, TBI patients on um, biomarkers. And um, they addressed four specific questions. Um, did a brain concussion occur? This is helpful in some uh, parts of the country on the ER, 
sometimes the people surrounding the patient, of course, can tell you that, but it might be needed to tell you whether you should do a CT scan on the emergency room or not. It, uh, they also checked whether there was data available about prediction of delayed recovery in moderately severe traumatic brain injury patients, not the ICU population. And then finally, they um, went through the question, can we predict the outcome in severe traumatic brain injury patients? And that's nice to know for us, I think. So these are, uh, this is their schedule, and they, this is the, an impressive uh, figure. And as you can see, they didn't only look at real brain biomarkers, but they looked a bit broader because they also checked for uh, coagulation markers and inflammatory markers. If you have a traumatic brain injury, you get a massive inflammation uh, uh, reaction. So you can expect that this is also can be used as a biomarker. Um, what they looked for is uh, they checked all the biomarkers studied and they came up with this uh, impressive table. You won't be able to read it, not necessary, so don't try it. Um, and they, for every biomarker, they defined an area under the curve, and this is what they used to see whether they were good enough. So let's focus on the severe traumatic brain injury patient, and this is table five in this interesting paper, which gives you an overview of all the studies done in this specific condition. Now, as you can see, I hope you can be able to see this, it's not very difficult. Most of the biomarkers, which are here in the list, have only been investigated in one or maybe two studies in, well, populations were sometimes okay, but sometimes rather small. And um, they did not find an excellent biomarker. And the good biomarkers were studied in only one or two papers. And what you also see is, for example, neuron-specific analase is uh, over here somewhere. Um, this is studied in many more uh, studies. And what you see is if a biomarker was investigated in more studies in different hospitals, different labs, the reliability goes down. So that's a kind of intriguing thing, and it's, it shows me that it's too early to use these biomarkers in daily practice in all different centers in the world in this condition. Um, now it might be explained by different, uh, the different time points of assessment or different lab kits used in the labs. So um, it, I'm not sh uh, convinced yet whether they, are reliable, we, they can be used reliably to predict outcome in patients we have on our ICU with severe traumatic brain injury. And I think this is one of the reasons they're not yet incorporated in the guidelines from the Brain Trauma Foundation. Uh, so let's move on to uh, cardiac arrest, another field where a lot of uh, studies have been done with neurobiomarkers. And I think we're a step further there regarding their use in daily clinical practice. And uh, as you can see here on the, on the left, right for you, um, this is the uh, uh, current advice from the European Resuscitation Council and European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, as was recently published by Jerry Nolan and his group. And um, neuron-specific analase is in there. It's one of the things you can use in your multimodal approach for predicting the outcome of your patient. This is aiming at prediction of a poor outcome. That's good to realize. Neuron-specific analase was the most studied biomarker in cardiac arrest patients. Um, it's advised to take your sample at 48, 24, 48, and 72 hours after cardiac arrest because 48 hours is the most reliable moment of assessment. It takes some time for this neuron-specific analyst to get into the blood and reach the highest level, which you want to know. In the footnote uh, accompanying this figure, it also says that if you have these samples and you see an increase between 24 and 42, uh, and 42 hours, or between 48 and 72 hours, this is also telling you that there's substantial brain damage supporting a likely poor outcome. Um, but other substances have also been investigated in the patients after cardiac arrest, and this is a list. 
And many of these studies were done in one large recently collected cohort from the first DTM study. And uh, they had all these uh, files, so they said, okay, look at S100 beta. Yes, it's a good thing, but it doesn't give any more information than neuron-specific NLA. So it's not reasonable to add this to your battery. And then other things are also uh, collected and investigated. And especially the last one, the neurofilament light, is a very promising biomarker. And um, other groups looked into this as well, and this is from an American uh, group. It has a very high sensitivity, and it's already very early reaching the peak level in the blood, and therefore um, it already very early after admission gives you information about brain damage. It's not, and this is a, a very uh, uh, drawback for uh, daily clinical practice, it's not an easy lab test. You need to have a, a lab which can do this, and especially, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, there's only two labs which currently have this technique available. So you, you won't be able to, to, draw, to put this, tick this box in your hospital next Monday and, say, and then uh, expecting a result, because I'm afraid your lab will call you and say, what, how should we do this? But it is good, uh, so um, what you can also see is, uh, I'll stop for a second for the Karelian. <laughs> okay, finished. So um, they compared neurofilament light in patients after cardiac arrest to other <laughs> neurobiomarkers. And here you can see the graphs, and this is at different time points. This is ICU admission, 24 hours and so on. And as you can see, the dotted one is the uh, S100 beta, which is doing worse. It's, not, it's, it's okay, but it doesn't give you much information if you see the line. NSC is better, but uh, neurofilament light already after 24 hours is a really distinctive biomarker. Uh, and I think this is the one that we should be going to use if we want to learn about neurological damage during long-term sedation with the disadvantage that it has a very long half-life. So this is not the ideal biomarker if you want to see what your therapy is doing. So this is a thing to keep in mind. And this paper was also only published last week, and it's again from the TTM1 group. Um, in cardiac arrest patients, you can also use these biomarkers to select the patients with a good outcome. If you find low levels of biomarkers, then this patient has a fair chance of a good outcome, even though it might take a while before recovery of conscious occurs. And this is a, important, because these are the type of patients in whom you should not withdraw treatment, in whom you should wait for two to three weeks, maybe, to see what happens. And this is a graph they give in the uh, supplemental uh, results. It's, uh, again, comparing the available biomarkers that we have from this large data set and what you see here again is that neurofilament light is performing best. So um, in conclusion, I think biomarkers, neurobiomarkers is a field in which a lot is happening and it's a promising tool for monitoring even in the daily critical care on your ICU, but there's things you need to keep in mind when you work with them. Currently, they're only reliably can be used, I think, in patients after cardiac arrest. And the other diseases that we would like to use them, the, there's not enough data available yet. And one other thing is never use these type of results as the only thing you predict your outcome on. Use multimodal monitoring. This is, of course, uh, what we advocate already for a longer period. Um, questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, maybe just a quick commentary on the utility of using the biomarkers as a quantitative, quantitative measurement. So like we've seen uh, threshold as an example after cardiac arrest, but probably 65 or <laughs> 650 won't be the same. Hope everything yeah. is fine there. Yes, um, for example, for neuron specific analyze, a lot of thresholds have, have passed, have come longer in the, last, uh, in the literature in the last uh, decade or something. 
And uh, first we had uh, 33, that was in 2006, when uh, uh, Rydix uh, published his uh, algorithm. And now it's gone up to 60 or 65. Um, and um, if you want to use your biomarker for prediction of outcome and want to base withdrawal of life supportive treatment based on the results, you want to have a high cutoff level because you don't want to take this decision on a too low level, taking the chance of this patient for recovery. So this is why I think the current guideline, uh, the last version has a, a threshold of 60, which is high. But if you go into literature, higher patients with a good outcome have been published. Yes, we know that this is a problem with the biomarkers and it's one of the main reasons that you should use it, taking into account the other test results as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move forward then with our next speaker, who is going to be Professor Thomas Kern from Groningen, the Netherlands, and is going to talk about how to select the best option. Please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, I have the task to summarize all these lectures that you just heard this morning and uh, give a recommendation uh, what is the best uh, option in my view. Uh, this are my conflicts of interest uh, related to this talk. And I take the liberty as a, an agenda to uh, take this figure that from our publication that we just published this week in Current Opinion, uh, which summarizes all these technologies um, a, and the techniques uh, that are available and associates them with the respective outcomes. And the thicker the line is, the stronger is the association with that outcome. So let's go through the technologies very briefly. You heard about the scientific evidence. Now we look at the recommendation. So how do I select the best option? So first question is, is my patient uh, on mechanical ventilation and is he or she uh, sedated? If not, we don't need any monitor because you can watch the patient carefully. The patient is his own monitor because he's awake, more or less. If yes, if he is on a ventilator, uh, the neuro neurological examination might be impaired and the neurological findings uh, might be masked uh, by, this, uh, by the sedation. So then, in this case, we can choose any of those um, technologies that I just uh, mentioned here and that you heard about uh, uh, the whole morning. So the next question I would like to discuss with you, or I like to ask, is the severity of illness. Because depending on the severity of illness, uh, this determines the severity of the invasiveness of the monitoring methods. So we have these non-invasive techniques that we just uh, heard about uh, uh, earlier, and we also had these invasive techniques that we also uh, discussed this morning. And depending on the severity, you cho choose either a, a more invasive or a less invasive uh, technology. So the next question we should like to ask, um, what do we want to assess? If we want to assess, for example, the cortical activity or the uh, depth of sedation, then we need one uh, technology associated with um, uh, cerebral uh, uh, electricity activity monitoring, so the EEG. And we have several uh, forms of that. The indications are, for example, detection of seizures after neurosurgery, for example, accessing the delirium severity, where we see a shift in the EEG power towards lower frequencies, and also predicting the outcome and the emergence from delirium. Um, but also the depth of sedation monitoring, and for that we mostly use a processed EEG. What is a processed EEG? So the EEG information is transformed, for example, in a color code, like you know from the echo machine, also a color code, or it is even simply a transfer to a single number, uh, like the, the PSI or the BIS value, where just a similar, single number, which is a, a dimensionless number between zero and 100, 100 being a fully awake patient and zero, no electrical activity. And you want your patient somewhere in this green range that he is deeply sedated. 
So we have the bispectral index, the BIS, the narcotrend index, and the patient state index, different companies, different algorithms, but pretty much the same um, uh, uh, information that you get from it. The advantage of uh, sedation scales, which we use mostly, uh, or our nurses use, is that it's continuously monitoring, not only once per shift, and it also allows, if you want, a closed uh, uh, loop uh, target controlled infusion of your uh, sedation drugs and uh, uh, energetics, if you like. Uh, there's a publication uh, showing this. So what do the experts say? This is from the guidelines. They say that processed EG monitoring to guide sedation titration may reduce drug doses and also hasten the wake-up times in selected patients, but with a low quality uh, of evidence. By the way, Giuseppe has, has left. I would like to ask him when these guidelines from for 2014 will be finally updated. Does anyone know in the room? Hopefully soon. All right. Uh, this is a, um, a cross-sectional survey uh, looking at the, uh, the use of EG monitoring across different intensive care units, and they found that um, it, EG monitoring was available in uh, more than 70% of the units, but 24-7 uh, access to the EG interpretation was only available in a third of the ICU uh, units, and only 27% uh, uh, had protocol in place how to use and how, what the indications are and the duration of the monitoring um, and the interpretation and management changed. So despite being recommended in the recommendations, the, the clinical use, there's a discordance between the, the clinical use, especially at nights, and, and the immediate interpretation, which is, of course, uh, necessary. The next uh, topic has been covered also uh, by Matthias this morning, cerebral oxygenation monitoring. Now let's focus on the ICU. Uh, you, you heard about these technologies based on near-infrared spectroscopy, uh, mostly used in the cardiac surgery uh, setting where, where um, Matthias and I work, uh, so, uh, and, and he mentioned that, but let's look at the ICU and from our paper that Matthias already mentioned, we only found one study uh, that focused on the ICU, the confocal study, uh, and since that time, uh, two other studies have looked at the association uh, of NIRS monitoring uh, to detect delirium, uh, also after cardiac surgery, so in the ICU, but again, cardiac surgery, for th they monitored for three days in the ICU, and uh, cerebral oximetry values decreased in the, uh, at the moment when the delirium onset was, and in increased again um, when the delirium resolved over these three days, and uh, so uh, cerebral oximetry was related to delirium diagnosis and uh, severity. And this is again from the perioperative quality initiative summary. Uh, so there is evidence, as Matthias showed you, for the preoperative and the intraoperative phase, but for the postoperative phase, there's a big question mark. So more research is new needed, and we cannot really uh, recommend this monitoring. Again, what do the guidelines say? So they say NIS monitoring is safe, it's a non invasive method, so it's safe. You can use it safely. Uh, there's insufficient and controversial data. Uh, remember, this is from 2014, so it may be more evidence now. Um, NIRS alone should not be used for routine clinical monitoring. When you use it, it should be used uh, to answer research questions, uh, but not to guide your uh, management, and, and it should be integrated into a multimodal monitoring concept. Uh, the next question that I would like to discuss with you is the cerebral autoregulation monitoring, which has also been uh, touched upon uh, earlier this morning. Um, so uh, there are several techniques to assess cerebral autoregulation. Briefly, uh, this is the autoregulation curve of cerebral blood flow. We have a lower limit and an upper limit, which we ha want to identify. The curve may be shifted in, by individual patients to the left or more frequently to the right, and a, a point uh, of blood pressure which would be near the lower limit, which would be sufficient in a normal patient, might be insufficient to provide adequate cerebral blood flow in those patients um, that are uh, uh, with, with a right-shifted curve. 
So this is an excellent uh, review, uh, just published, a physiological review, uh, many, many pages, uh, uh, present reading to, uh, to know everything about the, the, how it works, the physiology behind it, and the autoregulation. I would recommend it. I cannot uh, briefly, uh, even briefly touch on it. And if you want uh, something to read about the bedside application of this uh, method, you should refer to this review, which is also an excellent uh, summary of uh, the evidence and how to use it um, at the bedside. So how does it work? Uh, you can see a correlation. This is with the laser Doppler. If you lower the blood pressure, there is a certain point where the uh, cerebral blood flow falls, and this is the lower limit of autoregulation that we can identify. And uh, if the, the, at this point the correlation of a cerebral uh, of blood flow and, and pressure is one, so this is loss of uh, autoregulation, and if we have an autoregulation, the correlation is zero. So zero says intact correlation, one uh, no correlation. And then we can look at different values, uh, different blood pressures, lowering blood pressures. One, when does this autoregulation is lost? And <coughs> this way we can identify the individual lower limit of autoregulation, which is 55 millimeters of mercury uh, in this case. Uh, and this can be done in the ICU. Uh, this is uh, uh, Nears readings, and this is, has been used here uh, with this index to identify the optimal range of blood pressure in this individual patient, uh, trauma, uh, brain, a traumatic brain injury patient, and the optimal map range in this patient was between 87 and 97. So this way you can elegantly uh, uh, guide your patient uh, and, and find the optimal mean arterial pressure uh, uh, guided by this non-invasive method of uh, cerebral autoregulation monitoring. And this is a meta-analysis uh, summarizing the evidence of 33 studies, more than 3,000 patients with traumatic brain injury and SAH were included. Um, uh, so uh, results were that cerebral autoregulation monitoring can predict outcome. Continuous monitoring is better than intermittent. What a surprise. Um, so it holds the promise as a monitor for clinicians to optimize the cerebral perfusion and to minimize the extent of secondary brain injury in those uh, brain uh, diseases. What do the experts say, the guidelines uh, about this? So they suggest monitoring and assessment of autoregulation because it may be useful, uh, a broad targeting of cerebral perfusion management uh, and um, uh, continuous monitoring of autoregulation is feasible. This is uh, uh, not a very strong statement, but it's feasible. It should be considered as part of multi-monitoring monitoring. So with that, I come to my um, conclusions. So again, uh, looking at those uh, uh, tables, um, I, I did not mention the, the invasive methods because they have been touched upon earlier by uh, Giuseppe and Pierre. Uh, but the non-invasive ones you see here, uh, where to use them and what is the relation to the outcome. So there is a paucity of data or evidence regarding the effects of cerebral monitoring on patient outcomes in the ICU. Um, intracerebral conditions that can only be detected by appropriate monitoring includes subclinical seizures. So for that you need the EEG. If you want to detect cerebral uh, ischemia, desaturations, you need to, to have some uh, NIRS monitoring or brain tissue uh, oximetry monitoring or jugular bulb oximetry. Um, if you want to see uh, um, if the cerebral autoregulation is uh, intact and what's the optimal blood pressure for your patients, you should consider a cerebral uh, blood flow autoregulation monitoring using NIRS or transcranial Doppler. And if you want to see what the cerebral uh, metabolism looks like, you need uh, to look at the microdialysis. Uh, the process EG monitoring I mentioned can be used to optimize the sedation and the pain assessment in ICU patients, for example, during sedation and invasive uh, ventilation. The cerebral autoregulation monitoring may allow uh, to individualize blood pressure management um, and uh, invasive methods, uh, uh, as I just said, like uh, ICP monitoring or microdiseases should be limited to patients with a high risk of complications. And with that, I thank you very much.
Thomas, thank you very much for the great overview. Um, any questions from the audience? Can we please have a microphone yeah. here? I can hear you, but I'm not sure whether in the back of the room the right. I can hear you. Maybe. Maybe, maybe you say it and then if um, I can repeat it. Yeah. The, the, so the for the back of the room, just the question yeah. is about continuous TCD monitoring by robot. Yes. I, I don't have uh, personal experience <laughs> with this robot. I do have experience with the transcranial Doppler, and it's not always possible or easy to find a window to apply this method. And furthermore, the transcranial Doppler only measures the velocity, blood flow velocity, which is different from blood flow. So you can have a constricted vessel with a high velocity uh, and still have uh, ischemia or, or low perfusion. So I'm not uh, the biggest fan of transcranial Doppler met met methodology unless you use it for uh, uh, cerebral autoregulation monitoring. But with NIRS, you have a, a non-invasive alternative as well, which is most of the time giving readings, uh, even if you don't need a window for that, because the near infrared light penetrates the bone easily. But the transcranial Doppler does not, so you need to find a window. What, what do you, how do you reason about that the NIRS system only measures the frontal part of the brain? Actually, we just uh, submitted a study where we, where we measured in the region where the, where the ischemia is, uh, trans, uh, according to the CT. So we shaved the hair and, and measured on, on, on that part. But it uh, actually uh, does not improve the readings. So yes, you will miss a lot of ischemia because also the penetration depth is very limited. So you can have uh, infarcts in regions which you, which you don't ex accept, uh, access with the uh, frontal monitoring, but even if you know the region is here and you put the, uh, the sensor here, it does not say uh, that it uh, gives, gives you a perfect reading. It's more a global, like Matthias said, a global hemodynamic or cerebral perfusion monitor than a, a focused local uh, with spatial resolution uh, detection uh, diagnostic device. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up is Dr. Uh, Sujan Park from New York, and she's going to talk about how to combine different techniques. Hi, thank you. Uh, I have no disclosures. I have the pleasure or privilege to talk about how I monitor or how I combine these, um, these modalities and all the previous talks have done a great job in laying the foundation for how they work. Um, so some of this is local practice, so um, I'm glad people have covered what is guideline driven and what the evidence is, and so just to keep that in mind as well. When I think about monitoring, I think about the why, what, who, when, and where. The why is why is because in our brain injured patients or even systemically injured patients with, who are at risk for secondary brain injury, it's a little bit of a black box. You have some exam, you have some objective findings um, that you can elicit, but many of the minute to minute activity and risk is, is, um, is um, sorry, uh, it's 2 a.m. for me, is opaque. Um, and time is brain, so with each minute of ischemia, you have millions of neurons at risk. And so who are these patients? It's already been mentioned several times that it's really two types of patients I think about. One is that primary brain injury, you've had an acute severe brain injury, and now you're at risk for secondary brain injury um, from perturbations in the systemic perfusion. Um, then you have others who you're trying to determine what is the appropriate targeted perfusion goal or to assess and monitor for in increased intracranial pressure and um, intervening on that. Uh, what are the types of um, monitoring that we have available? The invasive and non-invasive are the two categories. I'm going to very much similarly look at the, the differences. And when do you use it? And so for the non-invasive, it's really any and all that you can think of for the sort of um, more awake patients who are at risk for secondary brain injury or in whom you want to assess a targeted uh, perfusion goal. And for the invasive, there's this balance you have to weigh. 
um, between those who are um, a low GCS who are more of a black box, either organically because of the disease or because iatrogenically you must sedate them to protect them and then they therefore are at risk for not seeing events because their GCS is very low. And then the how. So you can think about monitors as a threshold-based alarm, as a singular monitor. You can think about them together combined through visualizations, through scatter plots. And then finally, you can feature engineer them to determine personalized goals. And that's things like the autoregulation indices and such. Oops. So the way I split them, again, is the non-invasive and invasive. The non-invasive that we tend to use are the near-infrared, the pupillometers, the transcranial Dopplers, surface EEG, whether that's for continuous to detect seizures that are non-convulsive, or in the quantitative, where you look at spectral frequency to look at things like delta, alpha, theta. Um, the invasive ones we tend to use are the intracranial pressure probes, the brain tissue oxygen probes, the regional um, cerebral blood flow from thermodilution, their cerebral my microdialysis, we use depth EEG, and more and more the co um, electrical cort corticography or looking for cortical spreading to polarization. And for, these, for this kind of information, I want to stress for my talk more on how important it is to look, if you want to look beyond just a singular modality in the threshold base, it's so important to be able to time sync all of this data along with each other as well as with the more systemic perfusion physiology like blood pressure and heart rate, um, SpO2. Because single threshold-based alarms can miss a lot. And from a single monitor, it never tells the whole story. Um, in, in this case, this is a classic example of a patient with severe TBI who had many, many non-convulsive seizures. And you can see, prior to this, you would think from the guidelines that a PBTO2 less than the threshold of 20, one of the things that can be causative is seizures. And in fact, what you do see is you don't necessarily see a drop in PBTO2, which makes sense because a seizure will increase your metabolic usage. It will drive, actually, cerebral blood flow with the flow metabolism coupling. And what you ought to see is actually probably a maintenance of your PBTO2, if not a rise. Um, and maybe after sustained multiple seizures, you will start to see a drop. And in fact, that's what you really see. And see, this is a PBTO2 level of 20, for if you can't see the number. Um, you see multiple seizures in this TBI patient that were missed in terms of non-convulsive seizures. And only later on do you see this drop in the PBTO2. Um, and then this study by Dr. Claussen, um, looking at uh, this exact thing about seizures being seen, with m one single modality, you would absolutely miss this, but you see that in the uh, setting of an acute seizure, you see the rise in the heart rate, the mean arterial blood pressure, the respiratory rate. The, um, and as that happens, the ICP starts to rise. You see a drop in the um, jugular bulb oxygen because of the increased metabolism, and actually no real change in the PBTO2 until later. And looking beyond the, you know, the single modality monitor, it, being able to flexibly look at that time sync data and visualize it for yourself can allow you to gain a much um, better awareness of things like autoregulation state and how blood pressure might interact with, say, ICP or blood pressure might um, interact with PBTO2 or NIRS and other things like EEG. Um, and so in this, in this particular example, you can see that two things in this, in this patient seem to um, drive the ICP. So one is the pressure passive state suggested by the CPP opt, where, I'm sorry, down here, where you have CPP bins and the PRX, and you see um, an upward slope of ABP here, I mean ICP here, as it relates to um, arterial blood pressure. And this is just the histogram of how much time this patient st spent in a higher ICP, and that seems to be driven by ABP. This is an example of a patient with severe TBI. It was a 50-year-old woman who was struck by a vehicle, and she had diffuse axonal injury and bifrontal contusions. And by day three, she started hyperventilating, and her ATCO2 started to drop. Her ICPs start to trend down. You see these are two different periods in time. And when the ICPs are in a lower range, you can see that the, the relationship of the uh, higher maps in the third row here, if you can see the red, the higher ICP, higher maps are associated with higher ICPs. It's more pronounced. The same patient had been autoregulating well in the 60s, but with the passage of time, you start to see that the patient starts to have poor autoregulation in when the CPPs dip below the 70s, so you see here. 
Um, this patient's brain O2 had been unaffected by ICPs even when they went as high as the 20s, which traditionally you would think that should cause damage. And even with an ICP as high as 26, the brain O2 was stable. But in this phase of time in the, the changing TBI, post-TBI course, now brain hypoxia is occurring even with um, ICPs as low as 17. Patient was subsequently paralyzed, diuresed, improved ventilation parameters, patient was in ARDS, and the ICP, ICPs became very well controlled with no relationship between the ABP and ICP appreciated, and even with CPP ranges between 60 and 90, the autoregulation state was seen to have improved throughout. And then the higher ICPs had been driving down the brain O2, even at a re relatively normal ICP, and this relationship also improved in that setting. And it's just an example of using a couple of invasive monitors to understand. It's a uniquely European problem. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so the way I want to think about it is people often ask, how do you set up a, a multi-monitoring program? And often I can think of it in what is your capability of your specialized um, uh, interpretation experience that you have available locally, as well as what you can achieve in terms of setting up infrastructure for actually applying these monitors. So the ones highlighted here are the ones that you would consider passive monitoring. So you set a probe, either non-invasive or invasive, and you let it sit. You walk away, you have digitized monitoring values at a regular frequency, which you can set for, for uh, threshold-based alarms as well as some integration if you have that capability. Then you have these, which are more intermittent. They're set by protocol if you want to do it every hour, if you want to do it every shift, every day maybe during the week, without the weekends, whatever your infrastructure might allow you to do. And this is driven, driven by and performed by healthcare personnel. These require special interpretation and or a data integration system device that is separate from what is traditionally purchased for an ICU, um, especially the EEG modalities, but even the transcranial Doppler. And I think there was a question earlier about TCD. TCD is interesting because it does require some experience and finding the window um, can be challenging. And some patients don't have great windows because of the thickness of the bone. But with the experience of doing the TCD, you really, you, you really rely upon that. And from day to day, if the operator changes, you might lose the window, have different angles of insonation that actually influence the velocities that you see. The robotic TCD, I think the unique um, advantage of that is it tries to bridge that gap for people who don't have the ability to have very experienced practitioners. What the robotic probe actually does is you set it in the general region of where you might find a signal, and it systematically follows a grid until it captures it and it hones in, and that's the robotic piece of it. And so that's useful not just in finding um, the signal. Um, of course, you need to have a little bit of experience in where and generally, um, you know, enter to the tragus and which region is generally going to be found. But once you set it, that robotic TCD can often, more times than not, find the signal for you and hone in. It's also nice if you want to try to achieve something like a continuous autoregulation assessment. If you lose a signal because of patient movement, it can then refine the signal and lock on. So in, in these kinds of technology advancements are really nice because it really tries to broaden the, the um, the ability for people to do multimodality monitoring. So the thresholds. So we, I ten, generally tend to think about a severe brain injury, I already mentioned, if you are, I, are organically at a low GCS because of your primary brain injury and your secondary brain injury that's happening minute to minute, you're going to lose um, awareness of because there's just opaqueness. <laughs> Um, those are the patients that I might think about doing more invasive as well as non-invasive um, monitoring. But again, it, it does span patients who need to be controlled because of ICP elevations, for example. You need to sedate them, and their GCS might be lower for that reason, or procedures, et cetera. People are at high risk for secondary brain injury who don't have a lot to give in terms of a non-invasive or just neurological examination. This is an example of a 73-year-old woman who had an aneurysmal ruptured, um, aneurysmal rupture subarachnoid hemorrhage. It's a high-grade patient, and in this patient, around post-bleed day 10, 
there was changes on the continuous EEG. I'm not showing the, the quantitative here. That showed some suggestion that the patient was developing asymmetry, and maybe that was reflecting, reflecting delayed cerebral ischemia. And if you look at the monitoring, you see on post-bleed day, you start to see a rise in the lactate pyruvate ratio here as well as a suggestion that your brain hypoxia is, is occurring. And even in the CBF, you start to see more episodes of lower um, uh, cerebral blood flow. Um, what about in non-traumatic brain injury subarachnoid, not primary brain injury? I think there are, um, there are clear opportunities, as mentioned by others, in um, sepsis, in cardiac arrest, in acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, in ECMO, in fulminant hepatic failure. And clearly, these patients would warrant um, some non-invasive um, modalities. And maybe, I would say, um, starting to see people put out evidence that in, in well-selected patients, the, there might be a role for invasive monitoring as well, very much for cardiac arrest um, if the patients are selected appropriately, and maybe in fulminant hepatic failure. Um, I think the future, though, holds is um, maybe non-invasive assessments of things like intracranial pressure using modalities like TCD. Um, and uh, I think the decreasing technology barriers for doing electrocorticography, which is um, subdural grid placement for um, spraying depolarizations, will lead to wider adoption of this very useful monitoring tool. Um, microdialysis, which right now is an intermittent nurse-driven, very a lot of work associated with getting this information, which is really the ground truth. Um, the, the companies are developing more continuous microdialysis that takes it away from a point-of-care lab testing to more of your traditional bedside monitoring, but that is to come. And then this evolution, many people are working on data integration and visualization tools that become commercially available. There are a couple of companies that do do this, and there are many homegrown options that you can try to achieve this with not that much um, uh, financial support and also a little bit of el elbow grease and, and um, uh, plugging into the wider community. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions from the audience? Um, Dr. Park, quickly one question uh, while Dr. McCready is going to get up to the podium. So just, um, so, so it's um, obviously a lot of different monitors and a, a lot of sort of um, options that we have there. So how do you practically, like, like when you round, how do you practically integrate all of that information? How do you sort of have it affect your, and I guess that leads also to Dr. McCready's talk, because it sort of overlaps a bit, but. <laughs> Should I just let Vicky answer that question? Um, I guess for me personally, we, we use a combination, so, um, well, we use, I'm not, I use ICM Plus, which is a software program, and we have it set up so that it, we have multiple tabs available for um, beyond just the, th the threshold-based monitoring, so you can review in real time multiple times a day at will um, the integration of, the, of that data, and so you can see how your arterial blood pressure um, measures might influence your adjunctive monitors, even your primary ICP, and make adjustments as feedback. And what I think about, and I think about that is, a lot of times this is what our nurses are actually observing, and so this quantitative data helps you walk through it together and see a ground truth, and even try to distinguish, I need to keep my map above a certain X value or your CPP in this range, and that seems to be beneficial, and that's really just a feedback. I think the point at which we can start to use these targets, like your CPP opt guided therapy, is coming. Only, I think, last week the Cogitate trial for TBI was published for feasibility and maybe a trend towards improvement and outcome, but it wasn't powered for that. Um, but that kind of clinical trial will really make this less of a bleeding edge thing and more of a current, um, you know, guideline-driven modality. And I think once you have that, I think then the technology to be able to do this for everybody at the bedside, there will be a demand for that, and so the commercialization will be much more widespread. Thank you. So I'm um, going to introduce our last speaker of the day, Victoria McCready, and she's going to talk about how this uh, multimodal network monitoring could be an improvement or not. Please. Yes, thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. 
to talk about or positing the question, does multimodal neural monitoring represent an improvement? And as any good researcher, I'm going to upfront state my biases. Uh, and I first I thought I was going to do this talk to try and convince everyone, but I think I'm just going to give you the evidence and how maybe I feel about how it might improve outcome, and then you can make your own decisions. So I have no relevant disclosures for this presentation. And when I talk about improvement, so we're going to talk about improvements in possible clinical decision making as well as risk stratification and prognostication. And then the kind of the big golden nugget, right, Im improve patient outcomes. So our first neuromonitoring, our first neuromonitor, it really is our clinical exam, right, back to basics. But when I think about this, I think of two cohorts of patients where this is obscured, right? The first one is can't wake up, right? They're comatosed and we have really no window into what their, their cortical function might be or their brain stem other than maybe their pupillary examination and uh, their cough and gag. And then the next group of patients is not can't, but won't. We don't want to wake them up because we are possibly concerned about the stress response of holding sedation um, and the associated possible stress response of that. Talking about that, I think it's really nicely been looked at in single center studies by Raymond Helbach and Marcus Skogland, where they have consistently showed by the neurological wake-up test or sedation vacation that we've seen uh, increases in blood pressure and heart rate with the uh, concordant increases in ICP as well as changes in perfusion pressure, uh, as well as increases in serum stress hormones, and then actually differential results for brain tissue oxygenation and cerebral microdialysis. And on this, we can see that overall, as a quick summary here I've given for you, without, within those studies, you're going to, about a third of those patients, not be able to wake them up. And about another third, you're going to have to abort because of concern about instability, either cerebrally or hemodynamically. And then the question is, how do you, how do you actually monitor these patients? How do you have that insight into that black box? Okay, how are we going to understand if they have critical neural worsening? And so we talk a lot about the iceberg analogy, where at the top here we have our neuromonitor of the clinical exam, and we might start to think about below the water, what do we need to know to try and make some more tailored, physiologically rational decision making at the bedside. And so a lot of centers, maybe a standard, have that ICP monitor and we have an idea of pressure, but really we've seen a movement to think about pressure, function, flow, as well as oxygenation and metabolism. And we already have many of these parameters systemically in our ICU. While there's really not great data for any of them, but we really do rely on them at the bedside for clinical decision making. Some people may say, well, these patients who are already comatose, say like our poor grade subaracs, really are, have a poor outcome and you have to be watched for self-fulfilling prophecies and very early withdrawal of life-sustaining therapies. But that wasn't always the outcome. And this is a nice paper from some of my University of Toronto colleagues who did a cohort study at the university as well as a systematic review of the literature. And these are WFNS four and five patients who classically would have up to 100% mortality. And they find up to a third of those patients actually had a Glasgow outcome score of five or four. So good outcome or moderate disability, but uh, independent life. So when we move on to clinical decision making, even at the bedside, I might ask myself some of the simple questions we ask in ICU, like, uh, should I give my patient this transfusion? And as you know, a lot of um, neurocritical care patients, they have been missed out of or not included in many of the RCTs. So think about the ARDSnet studies for concern about high ICP with lung protective ventilation. Other things, although there was patients included in the TRIC study, and Laura Lynn McIntyre did a post-talk analysis of the brain injured patients, it was a very small group of patients. Um, so we still don't have great data, although Alexi Turgeon and Shane English, at least in Canada, and I think Fabio Tacconi, are looking at transfusion thresholds for subarachnoid and traumatic brain injury. I still want to understand when I should give a transfusion to potentially increase oxygen uh, supply and demand issues. And so we've been using near-infrared spectroscopy in prior studies to try and answer this question, looking at uh, pre, during, and after to see if it increased uh, cerebral tissue oxygenation. We find differential results, i.e. some were responders, a bit like a fluid response challenge, right, versus some were either no effect or actually decreased, maybe through blood viscosity issues. This is a really nice slide, actually, uh, that I've adapted from Mauro Auto, where 
we can see that, well, has it improved out, like, has it made improvements? So we can see that some of our classic management that we might use has been tailored or we don't use anymore, and that has been informed by these neuromonitoring studies here. If we move on to risk stratification and prognostication and some of the neurophysiological concepts that we have found, I tend to think of two things, so individualized thresholds and secondary insult dose. Um, looking at individualized thresholds, this is a great paper that I always uh, talk about. Uh, Giza and colleagues, where Gert Mayfreud is the senior uh, author. And they were looking at the ability, at least one part of this study, to tolerate intracranial hypertension. And there's three lines here. And when you move, oh, this is, doesn't look like it's working. Anyway, if you move from the bottom um, left hand up to the right top hand, you move from a good to a bad prognosis. And actually, you can risk stratify your patients here by they found that those patients who had, so we take a cutoff of 20, remember this was published before the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines of 22 as a threshold based, and all comers could tolerate about 30 minutes before they moved into that bad outcome. While as then they started to risk stratify and they took that same cutoff of 20, and they said, okay, let's take all patients that have cerebral autoregulation intact. And we can see that they tolerated 150 minutes, so much more time before they moved into that bad outcome. And then finally, if we take it those who had dysautoregulation or pressure passive, we can see that they tolerated a much, much smaller amount of time. So potentially helping us to risk stratify and understand how quickly we need to act and help prognosticate and put them into where we think they might end up. This is a, a nice uh, systematic review meta-analysis from uh, Rivera, Lara, and colleagues, where they were looking at the prognostic value of autoregulation. And uh, they were overall, they uh, summarized a dynamic measure rather than intermittent measures where um, better prognostically for outcome and that impaired autoregulation within TBI and subarach uh, was associated with a worse outcome. There is specific predictors that they thought were better performance than others, specifically in TBI was a pressure reactivity index using the ICP, uh, the mean velocity index using TCD, um, and the autoregulation reactivity index. If we move on looking at secondary insult dose is another way to risk stratify and um, think about prognostication using multimodal monitoring. This is the exact same paper by Guiza, uh, but they actually looked here at what we call the ICP dose. And so rather than going fr from a threshold based to more of a t area under the curve or time spent uh, with a higher ICP, and I think most of our basic monitoring doesn't allow for this, I would love, I think uh, Dr. Part was talking about it before, but if our data, our graphical user interfaces could allow the nurses to look at the time spent over the course of the day with a high ICP, it may make them more reactive as opposed to just seeing a one-time threshold-based value flashing up. Uh, and this study nicely shows that when they move from the higher they spend at a higher ICP, the worse the outcome. Okay. So we're going to move on to more thinking about um, patient outcomes. Okay, and I'm going to see if I can try and convince you, or at least it's going in the right direction. This is a systematic review meta-analysis by Andreas Kramer and David Zegan that they update every kind of five years or so. And we've seen that um, mortality and functional outcome in neurocritical care units has is, is much better compared to general ICU units. And some may try to say that's more of a physicality of a physical ICU, um, but there's many different factors that make up why we might see the signal for better outcomes in dedicated neurocritical care units. And some of those that I would possibly posit are just higher patient volumes and more expertise, conservative approach to prognostication and, and not doing such early withdrawals, uh, advanced neuromonitoring is in there, as well as the actual physicality of a dedicated unit, um, and then uh, adherence to management protocols. That may be just general management, but also may be protocolized for the integration, um, who to start monitoring and uh, how to monitor. And so we actually looked at the advanced monitoring and dedicated neurocritical care units as two separate entities to try and tease that out. And so we did, a, a, using the Trauma Quality Improvement Program, we looked at 155 centers across the US and Canada. And here uh, we had 
two variables. We had a dedicated neurocritical care unit and we, they self-identified through a survey versus a standardized management protocol, which uh, was mainly for protocolizing how to use multimodal neuromonitoring. And then at a center level structure, just to show you more from a neurocritical care, everything else was the same. There were trauma centers with surgeon, neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, and trauma surgeons. And the only difference was the dedicated neurocritical care unit. And we find that overall, oops, bit of formatting, is that going to a dedicated neurocritical care unit, at least in these, this trauma quality improvement program, uh, had no overall improvement in outcome while as patients that were admitted to a center or a unit that had a standardized management protocol uh, to help with multimodal monitoring for monitoring and treatment had an improved overall uh, in-hospital mortality. This, of, of course, is uh, uh, an association rather than causation, and we don't really have the data yet to be able to show that it improves patient outcomes. Uh, but I think we're getting there, right? So we talked a little bit about um, studies that are coming out. The first one would uh, be the, the BOOST uh, studies. So the BOOST 2, which was more of a feasibility study, which was uh, randomizing to ICP management versus ICP and brain tissue oxygenation. Um, and overall, they find that a reduction in brain tissue hypoxia burden, right? So we've proven that we can manipulate the neurophysiological parameters to avoid these insults. And now they're moving on to their larger RCT with patient-centered outcomes and appropriately <laughs> powered. Um, so that's underway and it's exciting to see when that comes out. And the next one, I think we also touched on it on the last talk, is the Cogitate study where uh, they just published their feasibility study looking primarily about, again, could they manipulate the time spent around CPP optimal versus a one-size-fits-all CPP greater than 60. And again, this feasibility study will move on to an appropriately patient uh, outcome uh, powered study. And so I think really it's quite an exciting time and it hopefully over the next uh, five to 10 years, we're going to get much more data to try and answer that very end question that I think everyone always wants to, to know. So for me, um, I, I tend to call it more rather than multimodal, but an integrative neurophysiologic monitoring approach because I think we can't underplay the amount of monitors, right? And the fact that who's looking at that at 2 a.m. in the morning is usually not me. It's going to be my junior who are, is already cognitively overloaded. They're looking after a unit by themselves and they may be an off-service resident or just started their ICU. And so I think we need to spend much more time on human factors and data processing and integration. And so I think we should move towards thinking about it in this way. But hopefully I've convinced you that multimodal neuromonitoring uh, really helps us to try and understand the fundamental mechanisms of secondary brain injury or brain insults, potentially t identifying new targets that we can uh, use for later RCTs. Um, and then novel understandings of the impacts of the interventions that we do using either physiological endpoints and as we've seen with Boost 3 and Cogitate, uh, looking now at longer term patient outcomes. So in conclusion, uh, neuromonitoring may help us to detect these potentially silent insults. I think it provides us physiological rationale for to guide our decision making at the bedside and helps to risk stratify and prognosticate. There really is not much data on what are the best physiologic processes to monitor and really which ones are the most cost effective and impacts patient outcomes. And then finally, I used to say neurophysiological parameters, one of the questions uh, not yet proven is can we modify them? But I think through studies like the Cogitate studies, the feasibility, as well as the Boost 2, we've shown that we can modify to try and reduce these cerebral insults. And now we're at the exciting point of trying to see if by modifying that, can we improve patient outcomes? Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for questions. Any questions from the audience for any of the speakers? I think actually all four are still in the audience. Maybe if while well, people think about a question, Dr. McCready. So, um, so if you think, I mean, you presented this data and ongoing work very well. If you think, I mean, f fundamentally your talk is what everybody worries about or cares about, right, with monitoring. If it doesn't help the outcome, then, I mean, 
it's just busy work and maybe interesting for science and it's not really, uh, what's the point? So yeah. what do you think are the most promising ongoing efforts or if you think about, should we rethink how we would answer, address that questions, that question? Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna say, I think the studies underway are the right direction <laughs> because there's been years and years of work into it. You know, I get a, a good question from some of my general intensive care colleagues a lot, and it's always, uh, this is just going to be another uh, pulmonary artery cath, right, for the brain, and it's going to show no results or negative. Uh, but I think we've learned a lot from those uh, technology uh, studies in the past, and it's really helped to inform how we can do these studies for the brain. Um, and I, I think that at least doing it systematically the way it's been done uh, to look at first the physiological endpoints and now the patient outcomes. Would, I'm, I'm not sure if I would do it any differently. I think for me, it's, I think I love the idea of more monitoring, but I just worry about who's, who's using that monitoring at the bedside. And I think it's usually the nurses or my junior team. Uh, and I think we need to be better at how we present that data. That's, that's great. That's, it makes a lot of sense because in the, in the end, it's like if only the person that looks at it once a day, right, has the sort of the depth of knowledge to really implement then, you know, decisions based on that, it's not really helpful. So I think that that's really... Any other questions from the audience? C can we have a, a microphone? <laughs> Maybe... So the question I think was in delayed cerebral ischemia, whether you ever uh, raise the blood pressure? Okay. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, we tried to answer that, didn't we, with the Himalaya study, and there was another one, uh, forgetting the, the study name of it, where they actually used induced um, hypertension to look at that, and it stopped early for futility, and then the other one was actually a two factorial design for fluid, uh, fluid challenge, or fluid balance plus induced hypertension. Um, again, that was more of a feasibility study, and hopefully they'll move into a larger powered RCT. For me personally, um, I, th I think of it al almost like a fluid challenge for the brain, right? So once you see those patients that I believe are pressure responsive, uh, will sit up and start talking to you, and then go back to sleep after their phenylephrine wears off. And, and for me, that's uh, quite hard to ignore, and I would treat them with that. Where I do run into problems or find difficult is a blanket approach to uh, induced hypertension to 200, 220, some of our neurosurgeons ask for, uh, for, for all patients that either they can't examine or there's a concern about it, because we've done a CTA just in case. And then what happens is we have vasospasm, but we've understood that it could be just epiphenomenal. And at least if I knew they were gonna go for that scan, I might have added on a CT perfusion to give me a little bit more about end perfusion mismatch. Um, so that's how I use it. I, I assess for whether they respond to it, um, and either I'm going to use a physiological endpoint or maybe an imaging endpoint. But you have to remember the side effects as well. Thank you. And I don't know if anyone does anything different. No, that sounds, sounds great. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, then. I think we're going to close the session. Uh, I think the next session is starting right after. I think I'm actually speaking there, so I'm <laughs> going to stay. Uh, feel free to leave <laughs> or stay. Thank you very much.